Welcome, welcome on this uh, beautiful Sunday rainy day. I think rain is beautiful, so um, glad to have you all here today uh, gathered for this uh, worship. If you're visiting with us and would like us to know who you are, you can fill out a yellow card in your seat. Otherwise, I invite you to stand for our gathering song, Hymn 695. our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy.
Let us pray. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We have our scripture read now. We have a reader for scripture. <laughs> Jovi, are you the reader? A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare it and set it before, forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Tell them, tell them, let them tell us Yet is what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witness. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is read responsively. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. May my heart fear your name. For your loving kindness towards me is great, and you have saved my soul from the bottom of the grave. But you, O oh Lord, are a God full of love and pity. You are slow to anger and rich in loving kindness and truth. Give me something special to see of your favor. Then those who hate me may see it and be ashamed, because you, O oh Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Please stand as we welcome our gospel. St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. We have uh, another parable from uh, Jesus in this part of Matthew that we've been reading these last Sundays. So Jesus put them before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And then that enemy went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came, and they said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And the master answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So then later he left the crowds and he went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. 
Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Thinking about weeds this week, in, in, in my neighborhood in uh, Melrose, in, in Pickerington, uh, weeds aren't allowed. We have a, a, a strict community enforcement. We like our lawns lush and green and chemically treated. Uh, every now and then we'll get a, uh, uh, some Yahoo that'll move into our neighborhood, probably from Pataskala or something like that, not know the rules. The housing, uh, the housing Association, we're, they're militant. They'll send in letter after letter until he starts towing the line. Uh, we don't do thistles or dandelions in uh, Melrose. We, we, we like our lawns green without weeds. Uh, and so I use True Green myself. That's the chemicals that I pay someone to come and throw down there, and it, it seems to kill everything. I got nice lush green lawns, uh, especially with all this rain. But here's the thing. You can't put True Green on all the mulch beds that uh, surround the house. I guess that's bad for them. And my wife has like 100,000 acres of mulch beds around my house, so I gotta, I, I, I gotta do that myself. I gotta weed that myself, and, and that isn't honestly my giftedness. Uh, nor is bending over, nor is working in general. So if I've bent over and I'm already down there pulling weeds, I'm going to pull as much as I can pull because I don't want to bend over and do it again. And let's be honest, it's all kind of green, right? <laughs> I mean, it's hard to tell the difference between all this stuff when you're down there. And so my general theory is productivity is, is the best kind of measure. So I'll pull daisies and weeds and anything else I can get my hands on, figuring we got thousands of those little white flowers. What's a few loss in the end of the time? So I am exactly the sort of clumsy farm worker that the master doesn't want anywhere near his wheat fields, right? Because that master in Jesus' parable cares so much about every one of those stalks of wheat uh, that he doesn't want efficient, productive, compassionless <laughs> people pulling out those weeds. He would just as soon let the weeds and the wheat grow together. Uh, than to lose one stalk by uh, one of his servants making a mistake as they're going through them. Uh, probably not the best way to be a farmer in our world today. Uh, probably wouldn't fly at all in Melrose and Pickerington, uh, but this is exactly who the master is in this parable. He cares so much about those wheat stalks uh, that he uh, wants the servants to just let the weeds go. Just let the weeds go. What would that look like in our world? I was um, on vacation last month. I, I read a book, a uh, wonderful book. Uh, it's called Just Mercy uh, by Brian Stevenson. Uh, I, I think you could say it either way. It's a play on words. Just mercy or just mercy. Because... What the book about is, uh, Brian Stevens is actually kind of a famous guy. Uh, he, he runs a nonprofit down south, a, a lawyer. The nonprofit uh, works uh, uh, with people on death row and children that have been incarcerated. Those are its two focuses children that have been incarcerated and, and, and people on death row. And, and the center of his uh, work is, um, is really what to do with these people that we've determined can't be part of the field any longer that we've, that we've pulled and, and, and placed to the side. Weeds, kind of, right? So he tells a lot of, of really good stories in this. The book is full of, of heartbreaking stories. And one of them that he tells is, is about a, a boy named Ian. And Ian in 1990 was 13 years old. 
Uh, his uh, mother had died when he was young. His father was never in the picture. Uh, gardens had raised him uh, pretty unreliably. Uh, he had had some few misdemeanors, shoplifting and vandalism. Uh, he pretty much was a, a part of the neighborhood, uh, raised uh, by the community, really, the, the poor community that he was in in Tampa, Florida. And um, so one night when he was 13 years old, some older boys uh, that were good friends of his um, took him along on a, a mugging, a burglary, uh, where a, a husband and a wife were out for dinner in Tampa, and uh, they mugged them. And, and they gave Ian a gun uh, uh, b before this mugging. And in the commotion of the mugging and the adrenaline of, of this action, uh, Ian shot uh, the woman. Her name was Debbie, or is Debbie. And uh, the bullet went right through her cheek, scarring her face, shattered uh, teeth on this side, and deformed in, uh, her jaw as it lodged there. Um, uh, the, the public defender that was uh, assigned to Ian uh, knew that in Florida, Ian would be tried as an adult, that he wouldn't go to juvenile court because the crime was so violent uh, with a gun. And so, but the, uh, the adult penalty for the crime was 15 years. So he, he encouraged him to plead guilty to the crime and receive that punishment of 15 years, which is what Ian did. Uh, the judge, uh, for unknown reasons, uh, decided instead to give him a punishment of lifetime in prison without possibility of parole. So, and then sent him off to an adult prison. Ian at 13 was small for his age, uh, so when he got to this adult prison, the, the, the most violent prison in Florida, it turned out, um, he needed to have the smallest prison uniform cut six inches off the legs in order to fit him. And the arms, the same. And um, because you're five times more likely if you're a child in an adult prison to be assaulted, they put him in solitary confinement in order to protect him and, and, and keep him safe. And solitary confinement in this prison was a, a concrete box without a window uh, that was about the size of our comfortable walk-in closets in some of our homes. And uh, you've seen these things on TV, right, where they have the slit where they push the food through three times a day. That, that's what this was. Uh, Ian lived in that concrete box day in and day out. Uh, he, he, he left four times a week, uh, that box. Uh, once, they put him in a steel cage and they'd wheel the steel cage out to uh, the yard where he could uh, enjoy some fresh air for 45 minutes. And uh, three times a week, he would have a shower alone in the shower. Uh, so he pretty much lived life just in communication with the guards um, and, and no one else. And if you've had 13 or 14 or 15 years old, you, you know that it's, a, it's kind of a hormonal crazy time anyways. And so you can imagine, uh, you can imagine how Ian uh, reacted to all this. So he started, he got very depressed. He stopped eating. Uh, started throwing his food. I uh, started cutting and self-harming himself, uh, self-mutilation. And all those things were against the rules of solitary confinement. So in, in a twist of, of, of sad irony, he would be punished for these things that, that, that he was doing. And punishment starts out as being they take your cat away. So for weeks he would sleep on the concrete floor in his box. Uh, but then after that, they started adding time in solitary confinement. So that even though he was put in solitary confinement to keep him safe, he ended up living uninterrupted in solitary confinement for 18 years, starting at 13. So every month he gets to have one free phone call, and, uh, and he didn't really have anybody to call. And after two years of making very few calls, uh, he got permission to call his victim, Debbie. And, and he called Debbie, and, and Debbie was amazed at the passion and the, uh, the regret that he expressed over the phone that just poured out from this 15-year-old that she was talking to now. 
And, uh, and she was moved by it. And at the end of the conversation, he asked if he could call her again, and she gave him permission. And Ian called her pretty much every month for the next 15 years. It was the only adult other than guards that he talked to in that time, or practically the only adult other than guards. And it was the only one who would hear about his depression and sadness and desperation. So after a few years of talking to Ian on the phone, she contacted the warden to let him know that, that he doesn't need to be in solitary confinement, could we let him out? She contacted the, uh, the um, prison system at the Capitol in Florida to tell them, she contacted the newspapers, and no one seemed to care about this weed that we had discarded. Fifteen years into these conversations, she heard about Brian Stevenson's group and she contacted them. And Brian Stevenson went and visited Ian, and he, said, he wrote that he was moved by how this young man who had been raised in our prison was so intelligent and sensitive. Uh, guards had given him books to read, and he was a voracious reader. He was also a poet, and some of his poetry is in the book, and I put a snippet of one of his poems up on the screen because it moved me. Entire poem did. And so Brian Stevenson had a heart for this case, and so he took it on. And the first thing he wanted to do was he wanted to have it publicized. So he convinced the warden uh, to allow him to have two hours outside of solitary confinement for a photo shoot so they could publicize this case. And Ian was so tickled with the idea of having his picture taken. He had never had his picture taken other than by the authorities. Uh, that that it, it, it gave a strange response to him. And, and that response moved me and obviously moved Brian Stevenson because he included the letter that he wrote after the photo shoot. And, and I want you to hear the letter just because I think it's important that we hear the voice of Ian this morning. And this letter gives us a good idea of who he is. Dear Mr. Stevenson, I hope this letter reaches you in good health and everything is going well for you. The focal point of this letter is to thank you for the photo session with the photographer and to obtain information from you on how I can obtain a good amount of the photos. As you know, I've been in solitary confinement approximately 14 and a half years. It's like the system has buried me alive and I'm dead to the outside world. Those photos mean so very much to me right now. All I have is a dollar seventy-five in my inmate account. If I gave you a dollar of that, how many photos would that purchase me? I don't know how to make you feel the emotion and importance of those photos, but it's real. I want to show the world that I'm alive. I want to look at those photos and feel alive. It would really help with my pain. I want those photos of myself almost as bad as I want my very freedom. In 2010, Brian Stevenson won a major Supreme Court case where it's no longer legal to put 13 and 14 year olds in prison for non-homicide crimes uh, with sentences of life without parole. Uh, in 2012, he won another case where it's illegal now to do that uh, for homicide crimes, too, if you're 13 or 14. Uh, but the states still have to be relitigated. So Ian is still in prison as of 2014 um, in his uh, 25th year of serving for that, for that crime he committed when he was 13. So there's a, a ton of evil in our world. And uh, uh, and we always ask, where does all this evil come from? And, and Matthew deals with evil throughout. If you read the book of Matthew, there's a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth at, at the end of time. And, and the way Jesus and Matthew uh, tells us to deal with evil is to wait for the end of time. When the sheep and the goats will be separated, the wheat and the chaff, the wheat and the weeds, the, the blessed and the cursed, the saved and the damned, uh, you, you, you get the idea. And so this parable that we have this morning, this is for us specifically as we wait for that end of time. What to do with the evil that's around us now. And, and we don't like 
the answer. Because <laughs> we like our lawns lush and green with as few weeds as possible. But in this parable, we're, we're told to, to let the weeds go. Not because they won't cause damage to the rest of the weed stalks, but because God cares that much for the weed stalks and doesn't trust the workers to figure out which is a weed and which is a wheat. You know, when weather gets bad and, and the environment's tough, those puny weed stalks start to look like weeds and it's easy to pick them and pull them before they're given a chance to become something beautiful and wonderful. And maybe even by the end of time, we'll find that there's not a lot of weeds out there, just a lot of brokenness in the midst of our world. And that even the things that we were sure were weeds was something that God could do something wonderful with too. It's a tough parable. Tough parable, but it should give all of us humility in the midst of our broken world. Uh, I wanted to end with a, a, a rewriting of this parable by a, a woman, uh, a famous preacher actually, Barbara Brown Taylor. I keep on looking, I want to say Smith. Barbara Brown Taylor, um, she's a famous preacher, writes a ton of books, and um, does speaking gigs and things like that. Uh, and she rewrote this parable that was shared with me at my Lutheran cluster this week and, uh, by another pastor, and I wanted to share it with you. Hear another of the parable of the wheat and the weeds. One afternoon in the middle of the growing season, a bunch of farmhands decided to surprise their boss and weed his favorite wheat field. No sooner had they begun to work, however, when they began to argue. First about which of the wheat-looking things were weeds, and then about the rest of the weeds. Uh, did the Queen Anne's lace pose a real threat to the wheat, or, or could it stay for decoration? And, and the blackberries, they would be ripe in a week or two. Surely they could stay rather than to be pulled, because after all, they were weeds in this wheat field. And the honeysuckle, it seemed a shame to pull up anything that smelled so sweet. And about the time they had gotten around with the debating about the purple asters, the boss showed up and he ordered them all out of his field. And dejected, they did as they were told. And back at the barn, he took their machetes away from them and he pulled up chairs for all of them and he gave them a glass of lemonade and he told them to just sit and watch the fields as the sunlight moves across from it. At first, in that sunlight, all they could see were the weeds in the field. And what a messy field it was. What a discredit to them and their profession. But as the summer wore on, they marveled at the profusion of growth. Tall wheat surrounded by tall goldenrod and ragweed and brown-eyed Susan, the, the tares and the poison ivy ate florists right alongside the Cherokee roses and the milkweed. And it was a mess, but it was a glorious mess. And when it had bloomed and ripened and gone to seed, the reapers came and carefully and gently and expertly, they gathered the wheat and they made the rest, all those weeds into bricks for the oven where the bread was to be baked. And the fire that the rest of the weeds made was excellent. And the flour that the wheat made was excellent. And when the harvest was over, the owner called them all together, the, the farmhands, the reapers, the neighbors, and they all broke bread with them. Bread that was the final distillation of that whole messy, gorgeous field. And they all agreed that it was like no bread they had ever eaten before. It was good. It was very, very good. That those who have ears to hear, listen. Amen.
sister or brother in Christ, a new stock of wheat planted by the kingdom of God. We believe in the church that the Holy Spirit becomes part of our lives in, in a real and mysterious way, a gathering us to be the body of Christ, preparing us for salvation, and making us a welcoming part of this world. Uh, when a child is brought uh, forward, we ask the parents or guardians to uh, bring that child forward and to make promises for him. So who's being presented to be baptized today? We present Carrick David McAllister to be baptized today. And called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you declare to have your child baptized into Christ? So this means because Carrick can't uh, talk or think well today, about anything other than food and going to the bathroom. <laughs> Your job then is to make promises for him. And so those promises are to be, are basically to raise him in the church, to uh, uh, bring him to worship regularly, uh, to put Bible in his hand when he gets old enough to read the Bible, to teach him the Apostles' Creed and the Ten Commandments and the stories of Jesus. 
uh, to help him come forward and eat the meal when he's ready for that, and to live a godly life so that he knows what that looks like by simply looking at his parents. Are these promises that you're willing to make? Uh, for John, you guys are making promises to help encourage these guys to keep their promises, uh, to help Carrick be raised in the faith. Are those promises you're making today? And we are making promises to provide a place for Carrick to be raised. We're simply surrounded by this community, by all of you saints and sinners, uh, broken and saved. Carrick might know what the kingdom of God looks like. Are you promising to create a place to raise Carrick in the faith? If so, say we do. In the midst of baptisms, uh, we make a profession of the faith in who we baptize in. So I ask you, do you renounce the devil and all the forces that will defy God? Do you renounce the powers of this world that will rebel against God? Do you renounce the ways of sin that will draw us from God? We use the Apostles' Creed to uh, state our belief in who God is. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Holy God, we pray that in these waters, Carrick finds new life, Help him die to this world and live to the world that you promised, the kingdom of heaven. Help him live under the rule of love all of his life, surrounded in the body of Christ that enforces that love. And help us, Lord, be a good community for him as he grows. Help us be a good community for all those who are hurting this morning too, Lord, in our, in our church. We pray for all those who are battling cancer, that are named in our bulletin. We pray for all those who are suffering depression or chronic illnesses. We pray for all those who are grieving, especially Carrie Clay and the family of Janet Sustead. And we give time now for names to be settled. Heal these, Lord. Amen. Carrick, you ready? You're doing better than your brother, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, come here. Put him over there. Carrick, David McAllister, you are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here, bring them around to me. There we go. Turn like this again. Let us pray. Holy God, in these waters, give Carrick new birth and new life from sin and raise him to eternal life. Sustain him forever with the gift of your spirit, the spirit of wholeness and understanding, of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, now and forever. Amen. Okay. You have been sealed now with the cross of Christ, a cross of suffering and shame, a cross of hope and redemption, a cross you will live under the rest of your life that marks you as a child of God, so God will remember you always. In Carrick, in the church, we believe that the Holy Spirit becomes part of your life today in a wonderful way. To warm your heart and to warm the hearts of others. May you live by that flame always. Amen. Want me to hold him? 
Try, try. There you go. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, I present to you our newest brother, Carrick McAllister. And now his cousin, Haley, going up there. Haley was baptized here at Messiah when she was an infant, and now she's going to affirm and claim her own faith as we hope Carrick will do one day when he gets to be Haley's age, his cousin's age. Uh, so Haley, <clears throat> how are you feeling? Great, are you sure? Yes, you are doing great. So I'm gonna start, Haley um, has been with us in confirmation and she chose a scripture uh, to speak to what she uh, sees as her faith uh, moving forward. So I'm going to have her share and I'm going to take this off my ear so that I can just hold it near your mouth, okay? So they can hear you. Give them the scripture verse. Did I say that? Mm -hmm. Joshua 1 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. Beautiful verse. Uh, so Haley and I got to talk a little bit about this. Um, about what this means to her, uh, to have God with her wherever she goes, and that she can be uh, courageous in her life. So Haley, uh, it takes some courage to stand up before this congregation um, and to profess your faith, um, remembering these promises that you just heard with Carrie. Um, do you promise to continue in this covenant that started at the day of your baptism? And you can say, I do, and I ask God to help me. Amen. Now, people of God, um, as, as Haley affirms her, her baptism, uh, we affirm our support uh, to help her in this life of faith. And so do you promise to support Haley and pray for her in her life with Christ? You can say, we do, and we ask God to help us. Okay, uh, let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give us new birth. You give Haley a new birth. You cleanse us from sin. You cleanse her from sin. And you raise each of us to eternal life. Amen. We're going to pull this kneeler forward. This is very exciting, Haley. Have you kneel there? Kneel. Maybe don't sit on it. No, you can. Just, just kneel down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you guys can come out. around and place your hand on her as we bless her. God, stir up in Haley the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. You can turn around, Haley. Congregation, can we give thanks that Haley has affirmed her baptism? Stand. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share God's love and God's peace with one another, with Haley and Carrick and everyone else. Received. 
uh, both by the church and the gifts that you might have brought for the, the kingdom work we're doing, and uh, by Brian, uh, who uh, brought a, a gift of music for us today. So why don't we enjoy it? This song, um, the song that I chose to do, I suppose there's a little story before it is probably just as important as the song to me. Um, anytime I'm asked to do a, a song, you know, and sing uh, here for a service, I get to read over, you know, the gospel and, and you know, choose something appropriate. This particular song, I wasn't certain uh, whether or not if it was the right song to do, so I sent Carl a message on it, and it just, it was the song that was heavy on my heart. You know, I, I just couldn't really find too many things when I thought about the parable of the weeds. Uh, not a lot of good song choices out there for that. And uh, this song, though, was just something that was just really, really heavy on my heart because I look at our life as, you know, the best seed we could ever sow. And, you know, we just continue to sow seeds all through our life. And it doesn't matter the smallest little moment, the smallest little thing we do or say. Uh, even when we move on and pass on and uh, those moments and those memories, somebody else may, you know, still harvest them. And this song, the first time I heard it, I just knew I liked this song. I've always really enjoyed this song. And I really didn't know why until I seen a live performance of the guy that wrote it. And then he explained when he wrote the song, he didn't even really know where or why the lyrics and the stuff hit him. He just wrote the song. And it was, you know, well after he recorded it that he recalled this conversation that he had with his grandmother. I, I have no idea why this song hits me like this, but it's just really hard for me to even just talk about this song. It just, it's, it's really special to me, and, I, and it's probably because of my love for my grandparents. Because this song, when he wrote the song, he didn't know where it came from, but after the fact, he remembered a conversation that he had had with his grandmother. And when his grandfather passed away, she was taking him to the hospital, and in the car on the way, the last conversation that they had together, right before he passed away on the way to the hospital, that she shared that story with her, with him, and, and you know that's just a, a memory, just a small seed sown that stuck with him, and uh, you know later on in his life he ended up you know writing a song about it. I just think it's a beautiful song. So I know the congregation we, we've lost you know some members this year, uh, and there's you know all of us has lost you know a loved one at some point in our life. So if you would just as I'm you know singing this song, just reflect and think about. You know, whoever that special individual was to you that you lost, whatever loved one that you had, you know, because I don't know that I recognize the difference between the weeds and the wheat in my own life, you know, and the busyness of the day to day of everything that goes on. Sometimes some of the smallest, craziest, hectic, you know, moments that we have really turn up, you know, to be a beautiful, you know, moment. Um, even a rose is just a sticker bush until roses bloom. So. Yeah. 
I invite you to stand in this offertory hymn. Let us pray. Merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it. Open our hearts to embrace it. Open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this gathering, for this meal, for your very Son, who came to give good news to the poor and to let the oppressed go free. And so we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Holy Spirit, through this meal, in this place, fill our hearts with your mercy, your justice, your grace, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the table God has set. You may be seated as we invite our assistants forward, and then all may come for this meal.
Spirit and His love, let Him fill your life and satisfy your soul. Oh, let Him have the things that hold you, and His Spirit, like a dove, will descend. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace, for you are Lord forevermore. Amen. Uh, real quick uh, announcements for this week. I'm just going to hit through uh, some things going on this week, and you can look for details in your bulletin board. Uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock on Monday, uh, we have our pub theology going on. Uh, we do this once a month. It's at Prost. Uh, you can come out for that at 7 o'clock. On Tuesday at noon is our senior luncheon. It's a hot dog cookout. And on Wednesday, our super singing seniors are uh, continuing their nursing home tour where they'll be at Amber Park at 2 o'clock. And we're also looking for uh, volunteers for our Faith on 8th on Thursday. Uh, if you would like to help out with that, you can talk to Sally or Dave Long or myself and Pastor Carl. Uh, they do this at a men's shelter, uh, serving dinner on Thursdays, uh, once a month. Also coming up this Sunday is our Elder Sunday, or our Senior Sunday. We did this last summer uh, where we celebrated and uh, lifted up the elders in our, our congregation, giving thanks for the wisdom and leadership that they provide in our congregation. Uh, it's a lot of favorite old songs and hymns. Uh, we have some uh, prizes this Sunday. Um, so please invite others, invite your neighbors, your family, your friends. Uh, if this sounds like something they would enjoy, come on out for that. And uh, this week, the confirmation kids got back from their trip at Luther Memorial Camp. We got back on Friday night. Uh, and so there out in the fellowship hall is a table with a bunch of photos from that week um, and, and some of the thoughts of the kids. I have two here at this service today. Uh, Jackson, who is trying not to be seen right now. Jackson, I'm going to make you stand up, though. There you go. Painful. Yay. And then Kai. 
Kai over here. Yes. So you can continue to embarrass them by uh, going and asking them about their week. We uh, helped out at First English as well as uh, several LSS food pantries and spent time at the camp. So with that, I invite you to stand for our benediction. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you God's peace. Let us sing. Go in peace and serve the Lord.